The story starts with Johnny Bright. It's always begun with him. Playing for Drake University, Johnny Bright was one of the first African-American superstars in college football. Accolades for Bright were many. Record breaker, All-American, Heisman Trophy candidate. Newspaper columnists called him the Great Negro Flash as opponents failed to stop the speedster on the gridiron. But on October 20th, 1951, in Stillwater, Oklahoma, the fate of Johnny Bright and the future of college football changed forever. Drake football today feels a little more than 100 players for its FCS team. But with roots dating back to 1893, the Bulldogs are rich in college football history. The jewel of the Drake program was halfback Johnny Bright. As a sophomore in 1949, he led the nation in total offense. As a junior, he broke the record for total offensive production. Drake football coach Chris Creighton said they go to great lengths to preserve Bright's memory explaining to each new recruit who exactly Bright was as a person, as well as a player. To be honest with you, the, the focal or the centerpiece of our history and our tradition is Johnny Bright um, and, and, and his story. And so all of our guys are familiar with Johnny Bright and, and his story. My uh, first reaction was that this that Johnny Bright was uh, you know, an all-star. You know, seeing the, just from seeing the stats, his name, the field's named after him, and it was just you now it's kind of like a I guess an honor to kind of be able to play on a field named after you know such a, a great athlete and a great student. This is where the story takes a turn. Johnny Bright is and will always be the greatest player in Drake football history. His days as a Bulldog and his subsequent Hall of Fame career in the Canadian Football League have cemented his name in Drake history forever. But what makes Bright known nationally was his trip as a senior to Oklahoma A&M University in 1951. The stakes were high on the field as both Drake and A&M were in contention for the Missouri Valley Conference title. But the rumblings off the field in Stillwater, Oklahoma were less about the game and more focused on the black superstar. A headline in the local newspaper ran, Bright, a marked man, and detailed how the Cowboy coaching staff had preached all week about stopping one of the nation's best players. Paul Morrison worked in Drake Athletics for 65 years and attended the game in Stillwater. He said it was apparent early on that the Aggies were playing rough with Bright. I, I remember very distinctly that uh, there was no question that uh, they were after John from the start of the game, as it were, you know. But I remember sitting next to Maury White, who was covered for the Des Moines Sunday Register at the game, and a former Drake athlete, uh, incidentally. I said, uh, boy, they're really getting to John. And that was before the incident, as it were. But, you know, he, he was a Mark player. By the, by the time they played in 1951, he was had received a lot of national recognition because he led the country in rushing and scoring and things like that, you know. So he was a marked, uh, he was a marked football player by that time. The incident is what has turned Bright's legacy from that of a larger-than-life football player to the face of a social movement. On one of the game's first few plays, Bright handed the ball off to a teammate and spun around to watch the result of the play. That's when he was met by the large forearm of a and tackle, Wolfgang Smith. Smith had made a beeline for Bright without even watching where the ball had gone. The attack on Bright lasted less than a few seconds, but left Bright crumpled on the ground with a broken jaw and Drake without their best player. The play could have fallen to obscurity, but the Des Moines Register just happened to have sent two photographers, Don Oldtang and John Robinson, to Stillwater. The images they captured are now part of college football history, winning the duo a Pulitzer Prize. Drake University hailed the incident as dirty, cheap, Photos made the cover of Life magazine and the front page of the New York Times. Seemingly overnight, Stillwater, Oklahoma had become a breeding ground for bigotry and intolerance. Drake demanded an apology for the incident from A&M, 
and when the Aggie administration remained silent, Drake dropped out of the conference. While the two colleges separated ways, the event would stay with both Bright and his puncher, Wilbank Smith, for the rest of their days. Bright went on to a successful career in the CFL, and after retiring from football, went on to become a teacher, coach, and administrator in Edmonton, Canada. Before Bright's untimely death at the age of 53, he was interviewed by a Des Moines paper and offered up his opinion on the reasons behind the attack. Bright said he believed there was no way the hit by Smith couldn't have been racially motivated. He did mention that he was grateful for the good that did come from the play, saying that getting his jaw broken was a wake-up call for the NCAA to clean up the game. A&M, now Oklahoma State University, officially apologized to Drake in 2005, 55 years after the Bright incident. With time as their healer, the two schools considered the matter closed. But what of the Aggie puncher, Will Bank Smith? Did he ever apologize to Bright or to Drake? What is his story anyway? Is he truly the racist that he was made out to be by the media? Or was he just some rogue who loved violent play? Not many know. Only a handful of interviews have been done with Smith since he slugged Bright more than 60 years ago. But now, Wolvink Smith is ready to tell his story. I don't think we can force feed anybody. And I'm, I doubt that we can get very many people that would, would change their their mind mind because they're, if they're even thinking about it this many years later, it's ingrained deeply with, within them. Uh, I don't think that the generations coming along behind us probably really really care very much about what I may have may have done you know 60 years ago. I'm Wilbank Smith. I played tackle for Oklahoma State University. I was born in 1930, so I guess I'll be actually 82 in June. The jury of public opinion has been out on Wilbanks for decades now. After punching Johnny Bright, Wilbanks was called nearly every racist name in the book and condemned for his actions by everyone from people he considered close friends to complete strangers around the country. In fact, I didn't realize, I, it took me years before I realized how foolish that I had, had been, really, because they were, what I haven't said is, is that they were threats to kill me. And so I, you know, I should have been doing, doing some, some things, but I, but I didn't. I just, you know, just tossed, tossed those, those aside. Thousands of letters poured in for the 21-year-old college student. Most in anger at Will Banks' actions, but some came in support of him. One that came from New York, and it was addressed to number 72 USA. That was the entire address, and it ended up in my basket, you know, two days from New York. And so that, that kind of gives you a hint as to, as to how much was going on in terms of letters from the outside. Well, the, well, it, it was strange in, in, in that a lot of folks felt like that I needed to be uh, given pain of certain kinds, you know, like maybe they won't, wanted to break my hands, or maybe they wanted to break my legs, or, uh, but they wanted something to be painful to, to, to uh, 
you, you ended up with about, I'll say 45% of what you got were, were those kind of letters. And then I got another, say, 45% that were uh, things like Ku Klux Klan, all that stuff that wanted me to come to Louisiana and take over the Clint Bear Klan and maybe come down to Louisiana and become a governor. Just, just, you had that, that feeling in, <laughs> in there. And, and maybe I had five or 10% of people that actually just wanted to make some real comment that was, was fine, you know, that, that they you know, wanted to help you out some, or at least, you know, just try to get things working. One of Wilbank's teammates on that 1951 team was Bruce Gilmore. Gilmore said he never saw anything wrong with the hit on Bright because that's just how football was played back in the day. First of all, uh, uh, there was never any question in my mind. I, I, did, I never did see Will Banks as being, uh, do it, being or doing anything any different than, than what was normally done on the football field. In my personal opinion, that might have been illegal, but on the other hand, it was sort of common. Sure, it's a, it was a bad experience. It was a situation that, uh, uh, that a, a player got hurt fairly seriously. And of course, you don't like for that to happen to anybody, you know. Um, but it, but, you know, it does happen. Gilmore said he had suffered the same hit Will Banks delivered on Bright from numerous opponents that season, and that he thought the media tried to make the punch out to be a black and white issue. If there was anything that was ever said that would be uh, considered uh, racist, it would have probably come uh, from uh, assistant the line coach Johnson or Whitworth. I was told, you might say, uh, from one of the players that, yeah, uh, I think it was Johnson, you know, that uh, uh, may have said something during the practice about, well, we got to get that black ass or, you know, something to that effect, you know. Wilbank said even if he was given the chance to apologize now, he wouldn't. The forearm shiver he hit Bright with was a move taught by his coaches, and he believed it was within the rules of the game. This is the first time Wilbanks has ever seen a rule book from his playing days. Well, they talk about the locked hands, but, but, but you also have, you say, no player shall meet an opponent with the knee, strike any point of the person the opponent's person with locked arms, or with locked hands. Forearm, elbow, or upper arm are striking opponent's head, neck, or face with the heel, back, or side of his hand. Okay, that's... It says during the game or between periods, a, frag a flagrant offender may be suspended by any official. But I, it, I don't think that, I think that that is not as clear as I wanted it to be. Is that how you had interpreted it? No, it really wouldn't. That, that, because uh, what's that? What's that? What's that? Makes you wonder, though, about uh, about the interpretation of, of uh, if you, if you do that on the on the on the defense. Well. <laughs> Well, I just, I just rather, I just would rather that that whole event would just be 
that just disappear and, and because as far as legacy is concerned, I think my legacy is, is ruined uh, and, and not that I, I, I'm not necessarily that, I'm really not that necessarily interested in, in, in that. I, I just wish that, that things could get, would, had worked out somewhat differently and because I did want to be, I did want to be known as a, as a good, good ball player and, and someone who did not get penalties. That was, that was one of those kind of the knights of the round paper. <laughs> Part of the reason Will Banks doesn't concern himself with his legacy too much is because of his wife, Joanne. Will Banks met Joanne just a few short months after the Bride incident. The couple's first date was dancing in the student union at Oklahoma A&M. After college, Will Banks and Joanne lived and worked in several states, but ended up settling in the town of Heber Springs, Arkansas, nestled in the Ozark Mountains. The two would still travel and go on bird watching trips. That was until Joanne's Alzheimer's began to set in. It wasn't until almost a year ago that Will Banks was forced to seek help, and Joanne entered a nearby nursing home where Will Banks visits her every day. She that that's again one something that just frustrates me unbelievably because it, because she makes that much speech, she ends up at, either saying something that's funny or something that's pleased her in that. You get a nice smile out of that, and there's it it just well, it's what Alzheimer's is. It's, you, you just have that dysfunction in in the brain because it's not hooked together. She will say my the daughter's name or the son's name, and, and particularly if we, it makes well. I don't like to get my hopes up for him, but it makes you think that she's that she's found something that, that maybe you know, maybe we can, can grow from. But. Uh, wonder that any good could come from a scene that seems so vicious. But Wilbank says he takes pride in the changes in sports and society in general that might have come at a cost in his own reputation. This was well, probably 10 years ago. And this, this guy is talking about the fact that Johnny Bright is his guiding star. Bright is already dead. You know, he died of the, of the knee. But but he goes on and on and on about how he looked at, at what Bright's career was, what what he was doing, how good of a person he was, and then he, and so he wanted to, and he looked at me in such a way that uh, he wanted to change all of his doings over to match up with, with Bright's, and uh, I thought, for the, my first thought was you know, it irritated me, and my second thought was, you know, if, if someone can change their life from being a bad life into a good life, and think that I'm ugly or whatever, let them have it, let them do it, you know, <laughs> take it, and and make that change, and, and dislike me all he wants to, and that's the way I put that one to bed. <laughs> but the, but uh, Road again. Just can't wait to get on that road again. The life I love is making music with my friend. I can't wait to get on the road again. Road again. Going places that I've never been. Singing songs that I may never sing again I can't wait to get on the road again On the road again Like a man with gypsy 
going down my way We're the best friend Insisting that the world keeps turning our way And our way